Welcome to episode 23 of the Creator Forge podcast, where we explore the question, what forges great professional artists? By interviewing visual artists and other creators about what they do, how they got there, and what advice they have for industry hopefuls. I'm Jeremiah Clark. And I'm Pat Bullen. If you want to give us some feedback, you can go to creativeforge.com, where you can find links to all of our social media. And please review us on iTunes. This helps people find us and lets us know how we're doing and what we can do to improve. Today on the Creative Forge podcast, we are interviewing lighting artist at Tripwire Interactive, Scott Warren. Hey, guys. How's it going, man? It's going very well. Thanks for having me today. Oh, my God. I can't tell you how excited I am to have you on our show today. First of all, I've actually never spoken to someone who is a lighting artist before, so I'm really Mm -hmm. curious about this. And second of all, uh, we needed somebody on the show. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm, I'm happy to fill in a time slot. No, seriously. Uh, thank you for making yourself available at what, like a one week notice or something like it's, that? It's so, like five days. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> We're always, uh, I think as of today, anyway, we are no longer behind on uh, our, our, our docket for guests because something really weird happened this time. I sent out about 10 feelers to people over LinkedIn at Tripwire and a few other companies and you know, just trying to keep some diversity of the different types of, of companies and projects that are happening in Atlanta. And normally we hear, if we're lucky, from like one out of like 10 people. Mm-hmm. And this time almost everybody got back to me and said, yeah, that sounds great. Or I've heard of that show. I'd love to be on your show. Or I listen to you. And I'm like, okay, this is good, but embarrassing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I, I, uh, you were the first one who just flagged and said, yes, I'm in. And that was within like a couple of hours, I think, after I sent out the, the f- feeler message. And that was awesome. I really appreciate it. And so we've actually got a pretty full docket over the next uh, six months, seven months at this oh, point, fantastic. which is fantastic. Yeah. We'll try and bounce back and forth between people in different types of jobs and, and different, um, different parts of the industry. So... But uh, really, really excited to have you and really, really appreciate uh, you being willing to be flexible and quick on the draw there. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So have, had you heard of our podcast before you came on the show? Yes. Yes, I did. That um, was tentative. That was it, very tentative. It, it Well, it's, no, I, I, I had heard of it, but I have uh, honestly not listened to an episode yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I think I'll listen to my own to, to start. Oh, okay, and then I'll okay. I'll go to the backlog. Gotcha. Fifty lashes with a wet noodle, and uh, and we'll talk later. But <laughs> I, I failed you, Pat. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, so where do you want to start? Well, I mean, let's just start with the the obvious uh, lighting artist. Yes. Tell us about that. I'm not really <laughs> sure where to start asking questions. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so lighting is virtual cinematography. That's that's it. Um, we make pictures in the computer, whereas you know the the film people make pictures on a set and they uh, the the biggest difference is that in I'll, I'll be referencing film a lot just because we use it as, as mm-hmm. reference all the time for for uh, cg lighting but the biggest difference is in film and movies you're building for kind of a locked off shot that you know once it's recorded and you know sent off to movie theaters it's never going to change you only have to build right. for one perspective in games, we have to build for every perspective that's possible that that the player mm-hmm. could see. So we're, it's more like world lighting instead of kind of shot lighting. Yeah. Uh, okay. That that is actually something I, I really wanted to get into because I mean I I'm a 3D artist. I've done a lot of lighting uh, stuff, but never for an interactive media. Most of most of what I've done has been you know product shots or. Um, just a single room, you know, it's, kind of it's thing. stuff that gets rendered and it's done. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's much more like cinematic lighting. And so that I'm somewhat versed in. I mean, I've been pretty happy with what I've done, but uh, working in games, working in an interactive medium where the, where you don't control what the camera sees at all times. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a whole other thing. And I've always kind of wondered how you would even, I, I don't even know how to approach that. I mean, I've done it a little, but like, like student projects, like nothing that I'm like, proud of and part of it is that it's just it's so daunting to approach mm-hmm. well we don't know how to approach it either this is what you do this right. is why we have you on okay we need to reschedule right. no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a fraud and you have the wrong person um, <laughs> it, 
it, every time you know you you start a new game project it, uh, because it's a game design dictates everything so mm-hmm. how the game plays what it's going to be about what you're doing in multiplayer um that is kind of the reference bible for you know all of the art teams um lighting kind of being the the cap on it but we are at the service of how the game plays so from there that kind of goes to art direction, which now they know mm-hmm. they talk with design and they figure out, okay, this is how it's going to play. And then art direction figures out, this is what it's going to look like. You know, it would be easy to say that for lighting artists specifically, we're just asked to make pretty pictures, but that's not <laughs> really true. We, we actually have to fit directly into gameplay. For instance, in multiplayer, the whole point is to, you know, gun down a fellow player and get points and be king of the hill for instance but if you can't see the other players or if they're disappearing into the environment that's a problem it makes it hard to play right so very quickly at the beginning of a project there'll be a tight loop between design and lighting so that we can make sure we are emphasizing their goals at the same time that we're making the game look pretty so the the prettiness um, early on in the project becomes driven by exactly what the game is going to be. So it's it's in service of, of in, in storytelling mediums we call this in service of the story. Exactly in games it would be in service of the gameplay. Um, and I've got just like a million questions starting to bubble up. Yeah, you yeah. first though. Go ahead. Well, so some of my my initial thought thinking about trying to light a game would be uh, if it takes place in a realistic setting, you have real world lighting. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of things that I've done where it's, you know, your render and you're done, I know that that's a good place to start, but Mm -hmm. it's not usually a good place to end because what looks good in the real world doesn't look good necessarily in, you know, in a piece of art. Often you have to do things that just are impossible in the real world, you know, lights that only hit certain objects or, or bounces where there wouldn't be any bounce, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, you're dealing in the real world, but you're still enhancing it. Exactly. Um, and, and that's where you get directly into stylization, which, I mean, so is, is kind of a tangent. There's some people think that you can kind of change the lighting or change the behavior of the lighting itself to kind of achieve a style. But lighting is, it, it's literally a universal constant. So it, it does mm-hmm. one thing. It's like audio. Um, it, it reflects, it absorbs, it diffracts, you can bounce it. And just to make clear, in the computer, most of the software that does lighting, it is programmed and set up so that lighting works like light in the real world, meaning. Yes, so for it, the most part, yeah. yeah. For the most part. And, yeah. and there's, there's tricks you can do and so forth, but for the most part, the tools that you have to work with would be essentially the same tools that you might have to work with in the real world. They're just digital versus an actual physical light that you're setting up to light a scene like in movies. Exactly. One of the questions that comes to mind for me instantly, when you started talking about making certain that if you're in like a first person shooter, whether it's multiplayer or not, Mm -hmm. and you've got to make sure that a character is lit up enough to be seen, whether it's being seen from one angle call it a camera angle, even though that's not what we're talking about, but let's call it a camera angle Mm -hmm. or another camera angle. Is, is that a situation? And I'm trying to frame this in an intelligent way. And I'm not sure if I can, because I don't know if I can speak intelligently about something that I know so little about, but you're fine. But if you're lighting in that way for that purpose, are you just using a whole lot of light or are you like literally the lighting changes depending on what angle that the viewer is seeing it from? Yes to both. Ah! Um, so it's it's one of those, when you, lighting is kind of one of those nebulous things where almost when you talk about it, you can only ever use artsy fartsy terms where everything is just kind of a generality. But it's kind of like, you know, talking about photography. It's, it's the same sort of thing where you talk about images with emotions and, and that sort of thing. But in a, in a specific case of lighting for multiplayer for visibility, you're going to get, mo- at least with games, you're going to get a lot of those answers just from playtesting, which is, you know, we'll go in and we'll play the game amongst ourselves and, and see uh, after my first pass, like, I'll just take a stab at a new environment. I'll just try something uh, based off of concept art, based off of what the art director wants to see. They'll be like, hey, it's going to be early morning and the sun is coming up from over there. 
and let's just see how that plays. And you'll play test it, and you'll see that all the characters render is is black silhouettes, and you can't see anything. So you learn very quickly. Well, that was just the wrong lighting direction to start with. Let's move the sun to the other side of the sky um, and make a, a big sweeping change. Uh, and then you play test again, and you it, it's a very iterative um, kind of slicing it into a thousand little little experiments to mm-hmm. to kind of build up an idea of, of so what you want it to look like. In the scenario you just mentioned, though, that's that's not so much that it's not like the sun is going to change position in the sky depending on where you are in the gameplay. That's just more like you guys tested it, you mm-hmm. decided to move a light as opposed to like what I was kind of thinking of is like, say that he and I are in and, and for the for the listeners. Jeremiah and I are basically on the other side of the room. We're in a triangle. Mm -hmm. So say Jeremiah and I are two players. We're looking at you. Mm -hmm. We're both looking at the exact same thing in the game, but maybe he's on a computer on the other side of the country or something, but that's not the point. We're both playing the same game at the same time in a multiplayer situation on the same battlefield, Mm -hmm. right? And we're looking at you, but the light might be coming, I'm pointing, which shouldn't work in a podcast, but <laughs> the light is coming from one side of you, which would normally blind him and silhouette you, right? Yes. But I can see you perfectly because you're outlined very well by that same light. Is it just that that's what's in the game and he's going to have to move in order to see you properly? Or is there situations where literally the game engine knows where he is in comparison to the target and then changes the light dynamically so that he can see you? Gotcha. Okay, that makes that makes sense. So actually, that would completely fall in the purview of design again, because mm-hmm. we have full control over um, what the lighting does in the engine. We're right. we're not kind of beholden to an automatic uh, processor effect that right. that may happen. So we could we can change all of that. Mm-hmm. We could make him. We could conceivably make all players look exactly the same to each other. But then that's probably going to take a hit in the art direction because it I might see. look ugly, for right, instance. Right, I see. Like, if everyone is glowing, for instance, then it doesn't really matter so much what light is falling on them. Right. Um, but then that would have to be a very specific art direction call. Like, do mm-hmm. we just want everyone to be a miss of blobs? Or do we want to go with kind of a more cinematic edge lit thing where, yeah, if you're viewing a character from... If you have multiple players viewing one player from different perspectives, they're going to look completely different to each of those players screens Mm -hmm. um and and, you know something like call of duty does that all the time if you're shooting at a guy in the woods um if he ducks behind a bush i might not be able to see him anymore but my friend who's 20 feet ahead of me gets a clear shot on right uh popping out of the behind a tree or something so there are occasions where you let the engine make some decisions but most of the time you you control it pretty tightly we we control it pretty tightly like specifically um with Unreal Engine 4, for for instance, which is used a lot, um, it basically models the behavior of light almost scientifically. You have to you have to beat it up a little bit to get it to do what you want it to do, but you could recreate full on photographs with it. Now, if that's useful for a game, that kind of becomes it, it goes back to design of like, do we want this to look hyper real? Because if we do, then characters might be hard to see and it might be hard to play. So then you start gravitating towards something that looks like Fortnite, which is very cartoony and it's very happy mm-hmm. colors and dramatic characters and it's um it's easier to play because of it. Gotcha. So what you're just saying with uh Unreal Engine 4 and um modeling realistic lighting, uh I, I did want to get into a question about uh like physically based rendering and that whole thing, because I imagine that had a pretty dramatic impact on how you do what you do. Because I mean, even as a as a modeler and texturer, you know, I get out of school and then immediately had to learn like a different way of texturing things because it all changed. But I mean, it, it's better now. But how does that is that does that relate to what you were saying there? And how does that impact what you do? Completely, physically based rendering is intrinsic to lighting. I mean, the two are they're married to each other. Really, you can't have one without the other. I'm so sorry, 
but I'm going to interrupt this. As the as the total outsider, I'm a 2D artist. I have no effing clue what you two are talking about. And I'll bet some of our listeners feel the same way. What is physically based rendering and what is the alternative to physically based rendering? Well, another reason I brought it up, by the way, is because I was struggling to explain it to some students. And I thought, let's have a lighting guy explain what it means. And so now I can be like, oh, well, I was talking to a lighter. Uh, Cheater. You know, yeah. Anyway, so, oh, man, so no. what is physically based rendering and what is the alternative? No pressure. So, okay. Physically based rendering, To I'll, I'll explain it with a tangent. If we kind of go back to, to old game development, which was all materials were a diffuse map, a color map, just the color of an object, a specular map, which was if it reflected something, what color was it, if it was shiny or not, and a bump map or normal map, which mm-hmm. would just control where the, the shadows landed on the surface. Um, that was it for the, the longest time. Diffuse, mm-hmm. specular, and normal. And some fancy stuff you could do on top of that. Maybe there was some reflection or you can make a soap bubble and it had a reflection on it, but it was very, very simple. And back, way back in the day, um, not like 1970s or something, but early 2000s, back in the day, materials in a game engine didn't really know anything about the lighting that was falling on them. So it was very easy to create really bad images. You could blow out a character material and it was clipping and it, it didn't make a lot of sense. And that's basically because you had two separate systems. You had lighting and then you had materials and each one existed separate from each other. Um, it, with PBR, instead of painting images that represent kind of the final look of what you want the thing to look like in the game, we're basically painting data maps or we are recovering data from real world objects and then plugging them into the game renderer. So. So the the PBR, the physically based materials would, or do, in modern times, respond exactly like the real world object would to the lighting. Okay. Basically, the material system can now talk to the lighting system, and they know of each other. And so if I have, uh, if it's a bright sunny day, and you take a, a black onyx chunk of rock into the sun, you're going to see the reflection of the sun, and you might see some scratches. Uh, on its surface, but you're not really going to see, you know, the light penetrate down into it because it's onyx. It, mm-hmm. it absorbs light and it doesn't glow. It doesn't look like wax, like a candle or anything. It has a very specific appearance. And physically based rendering allows you to kind of feed the game engine the data it needs so that any material based off of anything, a wood floor, a brick wall, a wet asphalt street at night, to where if you hit them with any number of virtual lights, the interaction of the light with that material will look almost photographic. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the olden times, <laughs> ye olden times, <laughs> olden back, days, just, them yes, olden days, back, back when there was MTV, um, <laughs> you would have just kind of a blobby, blown out looking surface. It didn't look real. It didn't look fake. It just it was just kind of there, but with PBR, it's it's photographic. We it, can compl- in response to the light more realistically. Beautiful. That's, you actually explained it better than I did. That's, that's the, exactly right. <laughs> no, well, you were you were doing great. It's just I, I I think what I what I try to be here for during 3D conversations that we have on this podcast is that every man who doesn't know crap about 3D and I try and ask some of the questions that I think other people who don't know about it. Or who even might be interested in it, but just don't know yet. Like mm-hmm. like uh, Jeremiah was saying, his students. I try and play that layman is what I'm getting at. Sure. And, yeah. and, and that's the best I can do. I do know a little bit about 3D. I work with 3D artists, but I'm not a 3D guy. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. So I, I will say, um, I I like I like the explanation. I'm going to use that. The, the, the lighting and the materials are separate. And now they're one system. Yes. That's actually a really good way to describe it. You used to have to paint light effects into the textures. So if this object was going to, you know, be in, in a, a room with a, you know, overhead light and it was going to be this color, you would paint those shadows in there. You would, you would have that light affecting that in the texture. But that means if you now take that object and put it, you know, outside, it looks completely wrong. Right. Mm-hmm. So if you ever had games where that happened, they'd have multiple texture sets or whatever. They'd have to swap them out. With physically based rendering, you basically just tell, you know, it's this color, intrinsically this color. 
and has these properties, and then the light does its thing to it. And, and when I think, when I hear that, what I'm hearing, by the way, is local color, local value, and that's the the 2D painting terminology. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and it's this, it's the same thing exactly. You've got your local color, your local value, which means the color and the intrinsic brightness or darkness of an object that you want to draw or paint, and then. Then after that, you overlay or you uh, alter that uh, to create the specific lighting situation that you do or don't want. And so, for example, if you're painting something that is in a tungsten lit room, tungsten is a very yellow kind Mm -hmm. of orangey yellow light. Then the idea being that even in Photoshop painting, you have to know that if you add that yellowish light on top of something that's blue, it's not going to be blue anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and it might look blue in that room that is overall lit in, lit in, in yellow, orange light, but you get, you get what I'm saying. It's the same thing. But then imagine that 2d illustrated asset. Imagine having a, a magically neutral version of that, that into any 2d project you dropped it into, it would just magically work. Nice. That is PBR. Yeah, you're basically the computer is doing that last step using uh, scientifically accurate. It's kind of doing algorithms. the algorithms. It's doing the painting part. The the yeah. renderer is yeah. is yeah. doing in that based way, off of it, the it, correct data that you yeah, gave. In it. a way, you're a three D painter. You, yeah, you know, I, I paint of. with light right. and it through yeah. volume and through time exactly. Mm-hmm. So now what got, what got us started talking about this in the first place? Oh, just <laughs> about the, the fact that uh, the like the latest version of you know the Unreal Engine um, Unity. Uh, CryEngine's had it for a while. You know, they they they, they use very um, accurate, realistic models of lighting. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. But so then that of course leads into the question of: Do you use it as is, as realistic lighting, or do you stylize from there? Because like you said, you have to sometimes bend reality a little bit to make it look the way you want it to look. It it would be very similar to at least from the lighting side, because if the material side, you can art direct all day long, and mm-hmm. and it's the difference between the scorched sunlit surface of Mars or a nice lush tropical location in South America, the, the light is going to do the same thing. You still have a sun mm-hmm. it behaves a little bit differently on Mars than it does here. Cause their atmosphere is different, but you still have a hard key light. It's going to bounce off the ground. So you couldn't really change the light to behave strangely because it, it, it's just going to do one thing. So then you just have to change the environment to look more fantastical, uh, to, to make it feel more stylized. But I guess it's a roundabout way of saying we're not so much limited to the lighting tools as is, but if we want to do a a little more romantic feeling lighting mood or a little bit more noirish mood, we'll start using kind of digital versions of real world analog techniques that you would do on a film set. We would do virtual Mm -hmm. versions of those. So a, a simple example would be Let's say you're trying to just make a flattering portrait of someone uh, and just take a picture of a virtual character. In reality, you would set someone up in front of a a screen, put a very large light source out in front of them so that their Mm -hmm. eyes will reflect it. If you do the exact same setup, if you recreate that same setup in Unreal Engine 4 and let the scene render and you take a screenshot of the character, it will be almost identical uh, if you're using the correct light values and, and that sort right. of thing, if you plug all of that data in, Unreal or any physically correct renderer will give you an image that's almost indistinguishable from a photograph. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really just because in how the lighting has been created. Well, that's actually kind of leading me towards a question. And, and this is relating back to some things with some of my students from a few quarters back where I taught a storytelling class and some of them were... Uh, animation students, and some of them were actually uh, game art students. And we were talking about the difference between storytelling, I'm using air quotes here on a podcast, it's wonderful, but storytelling between games and between animation. And uh, Brad Merritt, uh, who's a previous guest of the show, he is the uh, director of games for Cartoon Network Games. Oh, cool. And, um, And he came in and gave a talk and blew story out of the water. He said, story sucks. Don't use the word story. Da, da, da. Totally messing with Brad right now, if he happens to hear this, but... He uh, he had some really good follow up points, and he used that hyperbolically because there is still story in games. At mm-hmm. least that's that's my stance still. And he and I had a follow up um, uh, lunch later on where he said, "No, of course there's story <laughs> in, in games. I, I don't want to misquote him here, but in essence, uh, he said, "Yeah, there's story, but it's different." Mm-hmm. 
And so one of my questions that came out of your your earliest couple of points was that, okay, you've got uh, you've got lighting that has to facilitate gameplay, but nonetheless, any good game has different moods that happen during different parts of gameplay. To me, that is the story aspect. So do you do you receive for different levels and different moods during the story? Do you receive what is in essence the same thing that they receive or should receive in a good animation project, which is um, color keys and things like that, where a, a 2D artist or, or art director has come up with, in essence, the look, okay, we want this to look gray, dingy, and dark, mm -hmm. or we want this to be bright uh, and shiny because the mood is supposed to be different during this part of gameplay. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it doesn't... If it's a smaller project, you might not get the luxury of having it storyboarded with emotional color keys, but that's exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, here's this beat in the story, and the character is sad and lonely, and he comes up to this mountain, he's triumphant and happy. We, we completely use those tools because from a, a lighting side, since it's, since it's emotion, we're basically, you know, doing our own interpretation of depression and happiness in the game world. We need to know kind of like a, a lighting stage cue on a Broadway performance. We need to know when we need to start making people feel sad. And we can do that psychologically by, by relying on, on lighting to do that. We did a ton of it on, um, Call of, Call of Duty World War II, actually. So Alberto Noti is the lighting director at, at Raven, at least as, as, as far as this, this podcast episode. And he created an emotional script mm -hmm. based off of the, yeah. the overarching, for, for Raven's work. He created it for us. Sledgehammer had their own process, and then Raven, we created our own kind of key for it. But we would look at the work that Raven was asked to do in the context of the larger game, and it was Alberto's job to kind of figure out, okay, this is what we're going to be delivering to, to help finish the game. But within our own little story chunk that we've been given, this is kind of the emotional roller coaster we're going to go on. So going into the start of working on the maps that we were assigned, we had a very good idea. It was, it was basically clear what we needed to do um, emotionally, story-wise, geographically where we're going to be. We knew what the weather was going to be. So all of those things directly influence, you know, the aesthetics, what it's going to look like. Um, and, and certain things are just kind of automatic. Like if you have a rainy, foggy environment, there's not too many colors you can get away with, with, you know, <laughs> stylizing that. You kind of have to just let it play. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's rainy and, and foggy and depressing looking. You just have to play that up. When you get those color keys like that from, another individual which i mean that is pipeline yeah do you end up feeling more like a like a computer scientist like an engineer or 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 do you still get to put some personal stamp in there and feel like you're an artist I, do you understand where where i'm going with yeah, that yeah yeah it's uh anything that we get to light is kind of you know we're we're adding a little bit of our own perspective into it because mm -hmm. you could give if you had a, a room filled with 10 lighting artists you could give all of them an assignment to say you know show me happiness mm -hmm. just just show me what happiness looks like and you'd get 10 completely different scenes of what happiness is to those people mm -hmm. show you know show me anger and you would get some people might use red some might use purple some might use amber it, you you don't really know exactly what the result is going to be. You just know that for that person, that's how they interpreted your brief. Um, in that sense, it's it's actually kind of really, really personal because it, it was funny. I, at my time at um, Raven, I'm not, I'm not joshing you guys. I still love you. Um, I, <laughs> I was assigned uh, overcast maps. Uh, it, it just so happened that in the scheduling, I ended up with maps that were mostly overcast. And I got really good at making really sad pictures because <laughs> you, it's, it's not to, not to be too silly, but it's almost like a, a method acting kind of thing where you get into just this headspace of, you know, the world is ending. There is no hope kind of thing. And, and every day that you're, you're working in that same world, you just kind of, you know, your attitude changes a little bit. Oh, no. you, you kind of like, no, not today, Brad. I just, I don't want to talk to you right now. Uh, we got to make these clouds look sadder. 
Um, <laughs> but it, it helps, you know, you, you go every, every project that I've been fortunate to work on, it has taken you on kind of its own little emotional Creek run as mm -hmm. it were. So you're really, really putting yourself into the scenes. I mean, really taking it, um, I guess it's, mm -hmm. well, it, it sounds like you're trying to say that yes, indeed that that's art. I mean, that, that's as art as art get, can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's it's almost, like, it's weird. It's it's an interesting thing because there's a, I mean, there's a science to light. I mean, it is sure. literally a physical thing that you can study scientifically. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess art actually straddles probably further on either side of that line of science or art because there is a science to it, but at the same time, you could almost be more expressive with it. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, you, Okay, compared to you say modeling, just to pick a, a simple example, if I'm modeling a crate, mm -hmm. you know the, the ubiquitous wooden crate that the players smash open, there's only so much character I can give that crate. It's still a crate, right? Uh, but there's things you can do, but it's it's it, a crate's a crate. Whereas if you get oh here's a city street, but it's gloomy, mm -hmm. there's a hundred ways you can express that. Or even going back to the crate, it's it's like how. How is the light hitting that crate? What color light is hitting that crate? Exactly. How many lights are hitting that crate? It all impacts you with a very different emotional feeling. I was just going to say there's a potential downside of physically based rendering is that as the texture, I don't get to do that anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just make a neutral crate and then the, right. light, the lighting art, he gets to make it. Right. You hand he it gets to, to make him. it sing. I, <laughs> I get to make your crate look sad. After you <laughs> <pull it. laughs> but, but that's the thing is that the lighting becomes, you know, just... I would say just another tool in the presentation, but it is the presentation there. Mm -hmm. There's kind of this, it's not a phrase. It's not like we're, we're super clever and, and we coined it or anything, but there, there's something that my colleagues and I in the industry have kicked around the notion. And, and I believe this to be true. The notion that you can have a really amazing asset. You can have the best ZBrush model in the world. And if it's not lit well, no one's going to care about it. It, it, yeah. it, you can't appreciate the details in the modeling. You can't see all the little pits and dings in the face of the character. But you could have a pretty mediocre model. You can have an okay asset, something that's kit bashed and thrown together. And if you light that beautifully, it's going to be amazing. Because it's, it's the perception of how you are seeing this, you know, poorly kibashed model for the first time. Mm -hmm. As opposed to seeing this really amazing sculpt with lighting that no one cares about. So it, it can service that's, a bad asset, but we can't save great assets with terrible lighting. That's a good point. I, I guess, well, it's like, um, like how important uh, sound is to oh, a video, you know, yeah. to videos, mm -hmm. you know, bad sound will ruin a video before a bad picture will. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess yeah, that, I was just going to say that sounds an awful lot like that axiom. It's the same thing. If you go on YouTube and you hear something that, that sounds terrible, people are a lot more likely and a lot quicker to turn that video off than if it's got bad video, but still has fantastic audio. As long as you can be heard and as long as, you know, it, as it's clear, mm -hmm. um, people will forgive that bad video a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You're looking at me like you're crazy, like I'm crazy because you're a video guy too. No, yeah, <laughs> so, somewhat, but I was smiling because I was thinking of, um, I don't know who made it, but there was a clip where someone took the ending of Star Wars and they took out all of the John Williams musical <laughs> yes, score. I've seen that. And it was just the background sound. I, I don't know if, I think they created new Foley sounds just to make it funny. But if it were just the room sounds with no music, it was completely uncomfortable. It was mm -hmm. funny. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the funniest thing I've probably ever seen. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you got like people shuffling their feet and you can tell that there's something missing because they'll have this shot of them, you know, walking up that long aisle. But mm -hmm. it's just this. Damn, it's just the footsteps room. ringing out in the room and nothing else is happening. Right. The, da, 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 you know, yeah. which, and, and, and this, this all goes to artistry, but I mean, I've seen uh, uh, a, a few films that intentionally had no music in them whatsoever. And it created a, a sense of tension. Mm -hmm. It was intentional, but I think it's got to be intentional for that sort of thing to work. And it's, it's true in painting too. You, if you have something that um, is, I, I don't want to say that that great rendering can save a bad drawing because I don't believe that for a second. Mm -hmm. But great rendering can certainly do wonders for a decent drawing. You know what I'm saying? As yeah. where really poor rendering can ruin ruin a great drawing. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I was just going to say that um, bad rendering will take away from a picture. Right. 
right. is, is kind of the where Which that works still, there. It's kind of the same thing. I mean, if it's yeah. almost exactly what you just said, where, you know, you can have this great model and it's going to look great and everybody's going to recognize that it's great, but mm-hmm. it just won't, ja- it won't jazz them. It won't grab yeah. them without decent lighting. And, and, and yet bad lighting, like you say, can absolutely ruin a perfectly good model. You know? and, and that's why it really just comes back to the emotional cues. I mean, giving 10 people a, a different brief of how to represent the same picture, I think that sort of thought experiment and real experiment, if you did it in reality, if you asked 10 people to draw a banana, you would get 10 very different things. One of them might be a monster banana. You didn't know it was going to go that way, but that's what he was feeling at, at the time. So much of just, I mean, art period for games, movies, or music, whatever is it, it's just like this untouchable X factor thing. What equals somebody's personal style? Yeah. Yeah. It, and it's not that it's, it's better than other people's or worse than other people's. It's just, there are things people respond to and there are things people don't respond to. And you just, you try to do the things that people will respond to. You try to do that more often, but yeah, it's, it's so much of it is just up in the air and, and cool. That's mm-hmm. why it's fun. All right. So I, I've kind of, been enthralled even myself with all the technical stuff and sciencey stuff and now let's get to the meat and potatoes I, I, we barely even touched on the fact that you actually work at tripwire which means you're the very first person from tripwire interactive that we've had on the show and we're really excited about that oh that's upsetting we should get more of them down here they're, they're <laughs> awesome we should and as a matter of fact uh quite a few of them recently have said yes i'd love to be on the show and it, as i said earlier in the podcast when i sent out feelers i sent them out to a couple of different um uh, studios and tripwire interactive had like four or five different yeses and oh, i was awesome. like hell yeah yeah, yeah. that's gonna and, be great by so. the way your your job on monday is to shame the people who didn't say yes okay i'll, <laughs> I'll send out names. yeah i'll send kidding. out a group chat that is very <laughs> passive aggressive no no um so anyway uh, we're really excited about that and we just wanted to ask you know what it's like to work at tripwire interactive so it's it's free at least for me, I can I can speak for my position which is um it's very freeing actually. Oh it's, okay now that's an interesting way of putting it. Yes. You're going to have to elaborate. Well so in Tripwire's history they've kind of it's only been recent the the past couple of years that they've started grabbing you know specialists in in different departments because they've gotten to a certain size and they've been growing since they've created their studio. And they're getting more granular, more specialized. They're getting more specialized, which is usually what you see in a, in a larger studio format. Um, long story, but I started my career in Georgia at, at, uh, at the time they were smaller studios in that format. Everyone wears multiple hats mm-hmm. at bigger studios. Like when I worked, uh, at Raven, when I worked for Activision, um, everyone did one thing, you mm-hmm. know, it's, it's like being at the GM assembly plant. Every guy on the line does his, his role for the car. Mm-hmm. But specifically at, at Tripwire, it's great. My my friend Sean is is actually one of the art directors, and we've been good friends for 10, 11 years now. We kind of came up uh, at, at the same time in the games industry, and we stayed in touch. And I was finishing on, on Call of Duty in Wisconsin, and he's like, hey, you want to come back home? And I'm like, yes, because I hate the snow oh, okay. in, uh, in, in Wisconsin. Um so yeah. you, you were, you, oh, you know, we never even asked, where oh. are you from originally? I am from Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta? Yes, sir. Oh, holy cow. Atlanta, Georgia, not one of the nearby many little burbs. Yeah, basically Atlanta proper. I mean, you could say it was, it was mostly Marietta, but it was like, right. it was 80%. Atlanta. So, you're, so I'm going to claim the city of Atlanta. You're not a the southern. City of you're a southern. I don't want to say you're a southern boy because you definitely don't have that. You southern, ain't from around here. Yeah, you don't. You don't have that vibe. But you're definitely from a, a southern climate type, oh, yes. of, type of upbringing and cold. Not good. Yeah, <laughs> moving to Wisconsin, I thought I was going to die mm-hmm. um, daily for six months out of the year. So that was cool. Well, and apparently on some of those days, I mean, you know, how it gets in the winter. You actually could die. You actually could die. Yeah, when. Um, tangent but when i i was at raven and i met uh some of the the people and they were like yeah you know a couple years ago we had uh this like mortal air warning I'm like what is that and they're like well it was the wind chills down to like minus 40 so they just told people don't go outside or you're probably just gonna freeze to death no oh, holy cow that's sign so me up for two of those when you got yeah. yeah i think you said a gentleman named sean got in touch with you yeah, while you were my, still there and i i do want to backtrack and yeah, talk yeah. about raven uh later but yeah so sean got in touch with you invited you to come back and work with him at mm-hmm. tripwire 
and uh, and that's how you got in over there. Yeah, and, well, so it's it's kind of a bittersweet thing. I've I've known a good handful of people at Tripwire for like the last you know ten years. Oh, okay. When I started in games, it was in Atlanta. Um, I started at, at High Res actually, and those first three four years, you know, the game industry here is so small in Atlanta specifically. It's it's a handful of of studios, and we all knew each other we went to the same house parties and so we've we've stayed in touch um over time and yeah it was just kind of a, a happy coalescence of things where the the studio was getting big enough and they needed someone to specialize in lighting because they had never had that before um and i was like yes sean i will join you because you <laughs> are awesome and because you wanted to hit some warmer climate again that uh, didn't uh, hurt yeah. it 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 influenced the decision quite a bit, but I'm kind of curious. Uh, were, were you were you brought in to work on a specific project? If you can talk about it, I will say yes, <laughs> but you can't say what it was. And no. you only did okay. a tripwire for two months, though. So oh. you're still currently working on whatever project they brought you in on. That is correct. Right. That's right. I'm sorry. I I, I was I, for some reason I had the timeline a little wrong. Okay. okay hold so on. Couldn't, this couldn't is, this is a good point for anybody who doesn't know. What are some of the games that Tripwire Interactive is mostly known for? So they started with the the Red Orchestra mod, uh, where they won the Make Something a Real contest from Epic, and then they created Red Orchestra Two, and then they went on. They eventually went on to um, the the Killing Floor games, and, right? And those are their 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 big uh, projects at the moment. Mm. And those are the ones that I know the most for too. Yeah, yeah. And um, okay, cool. And did you have anything to follow up on? Like, I mean, uh, clearly you have like a family slash bunch of friends over there. So I would think that it'd be a pretty welcoming uh, place for you to work. It was, it was a trip. The The first couple of days, it kind of felt like a, um, you know, kind of a, a high school reunion kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Not, not in the high school sense, but, but definitely a, a really nice to, to see everyone again, kind of reunion. And it, it's it's neat seeing friends you've been in touch with over the years kind of move into these these leadership roles and really start to own whole projects. And it's it's cool to just see over the over the years how everyone has evolved artistically and how they've moved up in, in management. And it's like everyone has families and kids now. It's it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Yeah. It actually does sound like a uh, high school reunion. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, oh, everyone's growing up now. But that does actually play into uh, something we've talked about with a number of guests, just how small this industry is. Yeah, it's Not just here, but everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I just with people I know, um, I'm, you know, only one or two steps removed from like half the game industry in the country, it feels like sometimes. Yeah, we were even talking earlier about some people that we both know, and I think some of them are in California now and, and mm -hmm. things like that, which I, I, I should probably save this question, but I'm going to ask anyway, I, I know that You've had quite a career just in the last, what, uh, I would say eight to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And almost all of it, except for Raven, has been right here in the Atlanta game art and design industry. And I'm curious, before going on, I just have to ask this question. Like, so many people that I know who started here ended up going to California. Mm -hmm. Or it, now some of the people from California came here and vice versa, but there's a big lure in the animation and game art industry to go to California. So what, yeah. what kept you from making that leap? California is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Um, so it was weird. I leaving high school and, um, w when I thought I might've gone to, to art school or, or not, I ultimately did, decided against it, but that's a different topic. Um, we, we will talk about that yeah, just yeah, a little okay. later. Yeah. So Sieg, um, I left high school and I was convinced that I was just going to beeline it for California because that's where everyone was. Uh, and then high res opened like, I think a month after I had kind of made up my mind, like, yeah, I just need to go to California and maybe join the, the Sony PlayStation team or something. I didn't know. I didn't have a specific goal in mind. I just knew that California seemed like a good like idea. Said, that's a little lofty. Um, to yeah. just be like, I'm just going to go there and work for Sony. Well, you know, <laughs> I just go big or go home. I mean, you know? it's a good goal. I'm just, um, you know, the odds of that. But anyway, go on. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I, I didn't really have a specific goal for, for California. And then High res Studios um, 
in 2000, there, there used to be this website called beyondunreal.com, which was kind of a news compendium for all things. Any project that was using Unreal Engine, it would show mm-hmm. up. And there was this big header and bold, I remember. It's like, high-res studios hiring for all positions. All positions. And they're open in, opening in Alpharetta. And I was like, well, that's just up the road. I'll, I'll try. Um, and it just so happens in the year before that, or the year leading up to that, I had taken time away from uh, going to school. And I was working at Old Navy just teaching myself digital art. Mm-hmm. I my portfolio was god awful. Like the thing that I had dressed fantastically. Yeah. No, I was <laughs> I was dressed like a, a schlub. I'm just kidding. Um, I could fold the hell out of jeans though. Oh, okay. I can still do that. <laughs> hey, that's a skill. It, 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 oh, yeah. Fold clothes at a store. It's, it's, it's awesome. I was yeah. actually paid to just keep the denim walls folded all the time. That was my job. And I was very good at it. Um, <laughs> but I I had a really really bad portfolio that no one should have spent any time looking at and i shopped that to high res and they're like do this art test and it's like okay and then a week later i was i was hired sweet wow um, Hold on. what what year was that that was in 2006 i want to say that was september 2006 okay. i think mm-hmm. um and i was uh i was 19 oh wow so I just kind of okay. Well, let's let's just jump from there. Let's yeah. let's let's just jump from there, and and we'll come back to schooling and those questions and what got you into the art later. But so high res. How long were you at high res? The first time that I was high res, because I would go back for a year later. Um, I I started high res. I was there for almost four years. Wow. Uh, it was about three. Actually, I think it was exactly three years and eight months. And do you mind if I ask, what projects were you specifically working on at the time? Yeah, um, it was the studio's first project. It was Global Agenda. Okay. Um, and when I started in games, my very first role was actually environment art, which I was not that great at. I was, I was okay at it. I could build, you know, meshes and stuff, but they weren't, there's nothing to write home about. Mm-hmm. Um, I did that for about a year, and then... In the, in the second year at high res I started doing uh, visual effects and, and focusing on those exclusively. And the transition from effects to lighting was actually, it wasn't intentional, it was accidental. Um, there was a, a level designer, Tim, well at the time he was a level designer, or a lead designer. Uh, Tim Lindsay, they had kicked out uh, a bunch of new maps that needed to be lit. And typically up to that point the level designers were lighting it themselves which you know that's a classic kind of game development process the level designer blocked it out he lights it and that's it but at high res um, at that time there were so many maps that the the level designers couldn't be blocking them out and light them at the same time so tim saw the work that i was doing with vfx and he's like do you want to try this do you, do you just want to try lighting the maps and I said, sure. And from that point, I just kind of became the lighting guy. Um, and then I, I moved out of doing VFX only and kind of became a VFX slash lighting artist. And then in the years after that, I would just specialize in, in lighting only. Cause, Very cool. Because doing both, you know, they're, I think they each need their own specific attention. They're intrinsic. They need each other. They're, they are cut from the same cloth. But it's it's a very different mindset to focus. Out on. Out of curiosity, when you say uh, VFX in in the ter- in um, you know game design terms, w- what does that mean exactly? Are we talking particle? Effects yeah, particle or- systems, emitters, um, anything fired from the gun, any kind of explosion, um, anything that would happen in the world that wasn't the terrain or characters or basically the background art, any of that extra stuff on top would have been things that we worked on. So it was weather systems, rain, hmm. uh, splashes, uh, you know, little puffs of snow, footsteps running across a snowy field. Um, it, it could have been literally just an infinite number of, of kind of on-screen events happening. Okay. So that also kind of answers the question of what got you into lighting mm. as your profession in the 3D uh, game art world so i think that was something we were kind of holding on yeah. to for later yeah i, I was really curious because that just seems it seems really interesting but weirdly specific it, it is specific but that's um you know sound designers get really specific because you if if you know you want to do audio you have 
people who want to do Foley and sound effects, and then you mm-hmm. have people who want to compose and write music. It's both sound, but you you, you really, you know, if you're going to be a Foley artist, then your mind is going to be on, on that process. And if you're writing and composing music, it's, you, you're going to use like different halves of your brain or something. Um, and, and lighting and VFX is kind of that same like separation. But even leading into the games industry, uh, before I had, had done the portfolio and everything for high res, I, I did like a full um, recreation of my high school gym in Maya, which mm, was like, wow, it, it was, it was so bad. It turned out pretty, pretty bad, but <laughs> this is ambitious. It, well, yeah, it, it took like two years. Um, I, I had no idea what I was doing. But what was amazing, and I'm convinced that this teacher basically guaranteed uh, how my life would unfold. I had a graphic arts teacher, Brian Burnett, at uh, Osborne. He used to work at Osborne High School. He works somewhere else now. And this was sophomore year, 10th grade. I was taking graphic arts for the first time, and you have to take kind of this little placement paper test of like, what kind of graphic arts do you want to do? Do you want to do print? Do you want to do, you know, lithography, whatever? And apparently it is possible to just ace this test. I don't know what that means, but I did really well in the placement. And he's like, look, you're not going to really learn anything in my class based off of what I'm seeing. So you just tell me what you want to focus on. And I have some computers in the back of the room that you can use. I'm like, all right, well, I'm kind of interested in visual effects and how movies are made and stuff. He's like, all right, just do that. Like, great. So the first thing I <laughs> thought to do was recreate my, my school gym. So I photographed it and projected the photos onto simple 3D models. It was kind of super early photogrammetry, but really poorly done. <laughs> um, and then I tried experimenting with, with photo real lighting with that. And I kind of had that in my back pocket when I started looking at the games industry. So it's not that it really came out of nowhere. It's just I, I didn't really know what to do with it until I really got into games. Mm-hmm. Um, and figured out like, hey, I can do all the stuff I do at home here, but they pay me to do it. Mm-hmm. So that kind of cool. worked out. Well, let's move forward from sure. uh, high res. So okay. uh, you were only at like year two of high res, and yeah. let's let's talk further past that. Do you want to talk a little bit more about high res and where things went there? Why you left? Maybe anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Is that high res? So I was there for about four years. So year two VFX lighting. Year three and four basically lighting only with some little VFX. And after that point, um, CCP, which would be the the next studio that I would join, they were starting to advertise that, hey, we're going to be working on the World of Darkness MMO. And Hold on. Where did you see the advertisement for that? Oh, man. Um, Was it conceptart.org or something like that back then? uh, I think they just had it posted on their jobs page. I think it was just, hey, we're looking for some, some specific people and... And I, I applied and I knew Tim Lindsay, actually, which is funny. He's kind of led me into a couple of opportunities. There's been a few people in the games industry that have led me to new opportunities, which is why it's great to always be nice to people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, he had left high res before I did uh, because he wanted to move up and, and take on kind of more responsibility. And when he got there, he kind of beckoned for me to follow and you know see what was going on i was like okay i'd I'd love to work in the dark with vampires and wet city streets and stuff um and that was that was cool that was it was supposed to be my kind of my mona lisa but unfortunately it was uh canceled right ultimately yeah i I thought that was going to be a pretty cool project but unfortunately it never came out and so i was at ccp for about Gosh, almost three years again. I was, I'm starting wow. to see a pattern here. It does seem like most people I know, they either um, stick with jobs for a long time or they have very short stints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like they mix and match too much. Yeah. It's kind of an ebb and flow. That's true. So anyway, so you worked with a crap ton of amazing people over at CCP. Yes. And I, uh, some of them I, I knew at the time when CCP was still uh, trying to... Nailed down that game, mm-hmm. and uh, Trevor Claxton was one of them. Uh, Buddy Marco was another, and and these that are great brilliant. guys. Yeah, and they moved back out to California. I think Marco is in Seattle. So, uh, and two great guys who uh, kind of 
led me into digital painting a little mm-hmm. bit, which ended up being something I do every day for a living. So, and I wasn't even planning on doing that for a living back then. This was 2007 to 2008 timeframe mm-hmm. frame when I met them uh, here. Actually, I met them through a buddy through conceptart.org all the way back in 2006 or 2005 even. Wow. And then when I moved out here, uh, another buddy said, hey, you know, Trevor and Mark over there. And I ended up hanging out at their place together. So I, I know the caliber of some of the people that you were working with over at CCP. And they were, uh, they were great guys, first of all, and, and just insanely talented. Yeah, insanely Ill- talented. illegally talented. <laughs> it, was, it was really upsetting. But that's, that's kind of the best, at least as a, as a creative person, that is the best environment to be in. Mm-hmm. When, when you're surrounded by people who all know more than you do at like everything, that that's perfect because part of the draw of creating things with other groups of, of very smart people is to constantly be learning mm-hmm. and being around, you know, people like Trevor and, and there's uh, another brilliant uh, concept painter, Borker Erickson and his stuff is, it, I, I, I will never understand how he does what he does, but he just paints light. He paints emotion. he, he is the visual equivalent to what John Williams does with music. He just paints a scene and you'll either cry or just like, yeah, go to your childhood memory or something. I'm I'm sorry to say that prior to lunch today, when you brought him up, I had never heard of him and I looked him up on my phone and I was like, wait, this looks like, you know, uh, Renaissance level Mm -hmm. master mastery. You know, it it was really insane, and and of course we'll look him up and uh, and post a couple of links with this podcast. Oh, yeah. So oh yeah, and and he still daily he'll post up a little sketch, and it'll be like oh you know just at lunch, and oh, I just drew this and little you're like, thing. You bastard. Yeah, and it's how? it's basically <laughs> a, a quick little photograph, and it's like how right. I don't like you, but I I respect how you do <laughs> your your work. But no, Borker was, was so amazing. CCP. There's got to be some disappointment associated with your time there. Are you willing to talk about that? Sure. Um, at least from from what I wanted to achieve just, you know, as an artist. I mean, as, as everyone, as every artist there, uh, there's a certain amount of, you know, feeling like the rug is kind of pulled out from under you when... Um, I, I wasn't there like the day the project was canceled, but the, the writing was kind of on the wall for a mm. while. Mm-hmm. So knowing that this thing that World of Darkness that we all really loved and cared about, knowing that it was going to kind of go on life support was, you know, it, it hits you in the chest a little bit mm-hmm. because every now and then you should be so lucky to find yourself on a project that you just really want to inhabit and and get into. And for me, that was the first real project in my career where I was like, holy crap, this is, this could be really good, you know, if it's, if it's done well. Um, so we, we all really, really loved it. But, you know, at, at the time, um, CCP wanted to refactor their efforts to EVE Online. Mm-hmm. And it was just necessary that the support for World of Darkness was switched over to, to that side. And I think as, as a result, it just kind of fizzled out over time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I will say as a fan, I was pretty, pretty upset too. I've, I've been a fan of the world of darkness since, you know, the first uh, Vampire the Masquerade you mm-hmm. know, books were published. Uh, I actually got a bunch of people uh, from the original White Wolf crew to sign my copy of the Vampire Masquerade second edition. I think it is. That's the, the one I have. That was really upsetting. And I was in school, uh, in art school. What was it? Uh, 2008 to 12, I think. And during that time, CCP was one of those like, boy, that would be that would be the place to work. And they, they yeah. you know, they kept talking about doing like internship programs. I'm like, yes. And then it's like all of a sudden that's not there anymore. Yep. Now, I think that happened after I graduated, but it was pretty obvious that something was wrong before then. Yeah. You know? And, and during like, that time frame, I was actually teaching at the Art Institute of Atlanta at a now gone Decatur campus. Mm. Right across the street. Right across the street from CCP. And um, a lot of my students were, they were hoping, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of them like lived right down in that area and they were, they were hoping to eventually uh, be able to work for CCP. And some of them had actually kind of applied to some internship programs that I think 
didn't actually get off the ground, mm-hmm. uh, but that were supposed to have been started by CCP. But yeah. I think it was like right before the, like you said, the rug got pulled out from under. They, they kind of, if I remember right, they kind of did internships off and on. And then the last round, it, it, like it, yeah, it kind of fizzled. Right. Like they, they got, they got canceled, you know, because mm-hmm. they couldn't afford to do, I don't know. It was. Yeah, it, it seems like, um, it seems like CCP. It, it's it, it was a really interesting position that they were in because they already had a home run with Eve Online. I right. mean that that game is still enjoyed by hundreds of thousands of people today. It's oh, yeah, they're huge. just printing money. Yeah, you know? it's it's freaky how devoted people are to that. But so on one hand, they've already created this amazing franchise that has some of the deepest, longest running lore in any game in the history of humanity. Um, so it was. I could see how it'd be kind of hard to juggle, you know, something that you want to create a new versus, you know, supporting something that is kind of the money maker for the entire studio. Um, and and I think that they just they made the best call that they could at the time. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm. Yeah, I can't. I don't know enough to say whether it's a good business decision. I mean, I, I'm sure. sure it made the most sense from that. It's just. You know, from an artistic point of view, for and, oh, and yeah. as a fan, and for the from fans, a, yeah. from a fan yeah. point of view, I, I was waiting for a really good World of War Darkness game. I wasn't really a huge fan of what had come before, and mm-hmm. there were a couple of like what Bloodlines or there were a couple of games that they were okay, but the, Vampire the, the Masquerade, and, yeah, but the the an MMO in that world just mm-hmm. made so much sense, you know, because it really needed to be that big open experience, and yeah, uh, I, I still <laughs> lament its loss. <laughs> so oh, well. you said something about you kind of saw the writing on the wall was that the impetus in your departure from ccp that was part of it um the the other part was really you know you can never predict when these things are going to happen but my biggest drive at, at working at at studios is the need to constantly be learning that that's really kind of the carrot on the stick that just keeps keeps pulling me forward is Am I learning, and do I enjoy the people I'm working with? That that's really it. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm I'm pretty simple in that regard, but um, and yet those are tall orders. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, it's such a, a simple desire, but it's it's very hard to to find that in reality. And at CCP, I feel like I had kind of gotten to the point where if I had stayed there, assuming World of Darkness had, you know gone on and and would have shipped and we made it and stuff probably within a couple of years i would have felt like i was just artistically plateauing where i was doing Mm -hmm. the same thing over and over again which that's that works for some people i I, i'm not going to fault people's preferences that's fine i just know personally if i don't feel like i'm drowning and i'm trying to figure out how to get back to the top of the the pool then I'm not entirely comfortable. So the pressure definitely drives you. I love pressure. Oh, okay. Because Interesting. it forces you to make very efficient decisions very quickly. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds very generic, but that applies to everything in, in game development. I mean, if you have a, a trade show that you find out you're going to be presenting at next week and you weren't planning on it, well, now you have to show something. So... It forces your scope to become much more narrow, which means your effort on that now more narrow idea becomes very, very specific. So you become like a strike team. And I'm not a masochist, but I do like challenges. And I like not knowing, you know, what's going to happen. Just Mm -hmm. kind of coming up with So you felt like you had come to kind of the end of the learning process that maybe you could get out of CCP at the time. And so where did you go next? After CCP was to uh, Xaviant. Okay. And and with that was a whole different universe of learning because it was a different engine. Mm-hmm. And well, even um, even going from high res to CCP was a brain transplant because, you know, CCP uh, that's an interesting way of putting own, that. Yeah, they, they have their own technology. They have their own processes. So they had a, didn't they have a proprietary engine? Uh, very much so. Um, yeah. It was it was called Carbon. Um, and I believe that's still the name. I, I could be completely wrong, but I think Carbon is the name of their kind of technology bed. Um, okay. It's like a collection of, of all their technologies together. Um, so I had to learn Carbon for World of Darkness. And then 
going from CCP to Xavian, it was like, okay, unlearn Unreal Engine and Carbon, and now we get to learn CryEngine. So jumping around to all the different studios, you know, you, you get exposed to not only different work philosophies and different approaches to how to make these things, but you get exposed to a whole host of different technology, and it just makes you more versed in kind of how games can be built. And so what's interesting about that is it kind of gives you a bird's eye view of how to solve problems because you've solved them 15 different ways in 15 other, you know, approaches before. So your, your perspective just gets a little bit wider. I guess it's, it's like people who travel the world and they come back home and they're a little bit nicer. You know, they, they've been humbled by experiences. So being humbled by how much you hate a particular engine or how much you love this other one really gives you kind of a, your baseline appreciation for just doing any of it gets, gets higher over time. I I think I follow what you're saying. It gives you an appreciation. I found something similar happen. The, The more I do these podcasts, actually, the more I find out how things operate elsewhere, the more I've actually kind of grown an appreciation for the processes where I currently work. Mm hmm. And, you know, there's no such thing as perfect, but um, there's there's a lot of places that don't necessarily run like they should. You know sure. what I mean? And I think that's kind of a similar thing to what you're talking about. You know, yeah. you, it, it, you grow an appreciation for where you're at at the moment, A, for what you can get out of it, and, and B, it, it's it's in comparison to something else that may have been harder, worse, or just not functioning as well as you would like. That's you know? right. So, yeah, it's, you know. Man, it's like there's lessons to be learned in life and growing up or something. It's mm-hmm. it's crazy. <laughs> um, so Xavier, um, yeah. did you did you know somebody there? That's one thing we cover here a lot. Is like how how do you get that job? Uh, whether it's your first job or your next job or whatever. Yeah. And oftentimes the answer is it's it's not who you know. It's it's how well do you do your job first and foremost, and then yeah, a little bit of who you know. So. In, in my experience, at least how, how my career, where my career path has, has taken me, because oftentimes you don't you get to choose your destiny, it right. just kind of happens. Um, it was Tim Lindsay again, no actually. Way. He was actually the common thread from high res to CCP to Xaviant. Mm-hmm. Um, wow. And he was, you know, Tim's always been kind of like the, you know, the, the father figure, you know, to the, the ingenue wannabe art student guy (laughs) which would have been me because i didn't go to art school but um he we stayed in touch again at you know he left ccp i was still there and then he goes on to xaviant where he was one of the design directors so now he he has some clout and there's they started pre-production on lichdom using cryengine and tim pinged me he's like hey how do you feel about working on a, a fantasy game and I was like, okay, that sounds great. So is there anything else further that you wanted to talk about, Xavier? We're kind of running a little s- short on time, and there's still quite a bit of ground that I want to cover. Your time at Xavier was how long? Uh, about three years again. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So you Three is a magic number. Yeah, and I know that we're, we're going we're to end up having to kind of rush through it because you've had a hell of a career in a relatively short period of time. Let's so speed run what, can you talk about it? What games were you working on at Xavier? Uh, Xavier, we made Lichdom. Okay. And that was made using uh, CryEngine. And yeah, that was crazy. We we basically just had full artistic freedom for three years. It was mm-hmm. it was beautiful. Very cool. Um, and then from there, I went on to uh, Raven in Wisconsin mm-hmm. because uh, I knew another friend, Stephen Jenkins. What's up, Stephen? If you're listening, which you better. <laughs> um, I'll link him to this. He'll love it. Awesome. Yeah. So you should send him the link. Yeah, Make sure he go. listens to it. Now you have to listen to it, Steve. And then um, he can tell two friends and they can tell two anyway. And so on. And so <laughs> yeah. on. Yeah. Stephen Jenkins, we had been friends again, like with Tim Lindsay. I, mm-hmm. I had known Stephen for, for years and we had actually only ever met in person once um, in like a seven year span. Like mm-hmm. We'd only ever met once and then just went our separate ways. Um, but he had been the technical lighting artist at Raven. and. He was just like, hey, Scott, how would you like to work on uh, on Call of Duty? I'm like, okay, let's <laughs> let's work on Call of Duty. Um, and so my fiance and I uh, moved up to Wisconsin, and we were there for a, almost two years. It was like one year and eight months. Um, and, and that was that, that was actually a pretty amazing experience, because it was the first time I had ever worked on 
a lighting team, and there were seven of oh, us, wow. seven, eight of us, mm. um, directed by Alberto Noti. And it was it was neat having like the you know the perspective of other people who aren't in your own head. You know, it was interesting <laughs> pre- presenting something, and someone else is like, "Well, that's crap." <laughs> And it's like, well, I just hate your face. But you, you all kind of, we would have these boardroom meetings and, and just have uh, legitimate art critiques about the lighting and everything we were creating. Just to be clear, when you say boardroom meetings, I think of like owners of the company sitting in a boardroom or something like that. You're, you're talking about a meeting of all the artists getting together yeah. and picking each other's brains and picking apart each other's work and stuff like that exactly and we would probably have the most insane sounding conversations if people were to walk in on them because it was just talking about feelings and colors and hue and everything and things that most people don't care about but is literally our job description Mm -hmm. um and we would just talk about that all day long so you're saying you had i think you said something like legitimate art critiques yeah um, because that's that seems like an essential thing that um in in my limited experience of people i know doesn't seem to happen in a lot of studios yeah it's like you know i mean obviously the opinion that matters from the artist's point of view is you know the art director or their lead or whatever but But you're talking about amongst peers yeah i I, I know for for me going through school and and you know professionally that's that's so valuable to get that kind of honest constructive feedback it keeps you humble if yeah. you're if you're not isolated and you don't think everything you're making is just the greatest thing ever which one is a great way to stop learning mm-hmm. once you are convinced you've already achieved success you can just stop and the learning stops too um the critiques were great because we were just getting the gut reaction from the room when we would present images like here's this new section of the world war 2 map what do you think it's like uh it feels too happy you know, and then we would go from there. Right. Like maybe we'd make the sun dimmer, bring in some clouds, maybe FX does some black smoke floating around. And it's so funny to hear this after earlier in the podcast talking about all these scientific terminologies mm-hmm. and, and all the different softwares and all the very uh, technical type stuff. Yeah. But ultimately what you are trying to achieve is a story point and something that makes someone feel something. Exactly. Yeah, that's all, great. All of the scientific underpinning, all of the the science behind that, you know, you get to a certain point, especially working on a lighting team, that all of that is generally understood by everyone. And so we can kind of transcend. The conversation isn't how are we going to do this? It's what are we going to do? Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. can just focus on the artistry. Because everybody there is an expert. Right. Everybody we already know knows, how. Knows how to do it. Yeah. Right. You're like, it's no big thing. We know how light works. It's, it's easy. Right. But when you can kind of get away from the technical details that don't really matter to the end user, they're never going to see that. They'll never know mm-hmm. any of these decisions were being made. And so, sorry, I, I'm going to jump forward because again, because of the time sure. situation, but that was great. Um, and it, it's the kind of stuff I love to talk about as an artist. But um, so you were not at Raven for three years, though, correct? You were there for about two years. Is that correct? I was there for one year and eight months. Exactly. So actually. The, the cold really did break your habit of that three year stint. It was really it, did. Yeah. I, it, it took I deadly cold. It took to deadly cold to change your, yes. your, your system. I so. had never experienced skin burning in the wind until oh, wow. I had lived in wisconsin wow and that's not a feeling i ever want to feel again Pat. <laughs> it it was not happy so um but you had a great experience within raven itself from the sound of it now oh, yeah. where you are now at tripwire are you also working with other lighting uh experts or are you kind of back to being the one-man show i'm back to being the one-man show again mm-hmm. and it's actually kind of weird because it's a lot more quiet <laughs> okay. I kind of just exists under my headphones when I'm not talking to to Sean or, or David. But yeah, it's on 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 one hand, I kind of like that because I get to be the only one playing God, and mm-hmm. there's no one to really tell me I'm wrong, which is nice. <laughs> but you know, it it's still you got to miss that camaraderie, though. It, it was nice. There, yeah. There's some really amazing people up at Raven that I that I do miss, and I keep in touch with them when I can, and. Yeah, the, the talent up there was was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It is ridiculous because they're still awesome. I love you all. <laughs> uh, I can also say it, it is sometimes very lonely being the one person who understands what you're doing. Sure. Job. I've been there. Most jobs I've had, I've 
for some reason, I've been the one person who did what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, my previous career was drafting. I was the one drafter, you know, or whatever. You're trying to explain to people, like, why does this take five days? I'm like, because it does. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can't begin to explain this. Yeah, you without know? you knowing what I know, without you also being an expert, you're not going to understand all of these yeah. things that go into doing this thing that you think should take five minutes, but actually it takes two or three days. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one reason it's kind of nice. My, my current job, I'm one of three, uh, actually four now. We just hired a new guy, four graphic art or uh, 3D artists. So even though no one outside of our department understands, at least if we have a disagreement, y- you can get back up. You know, like, oh, we'll, we'll ask him, you know, he'll right. back me up on this. And, and of <laughs> right. course, we have our own arguments. And that, that's a nice thing, too. And, you know, sometimes there's the danger of having to justify your existence to, to mm-hmm. powers that be that don't understand what you do. But on the other hand, you can sometimes get that, you know, people are just fully deferential to you. Like, oh, he's he's the guy, you know, he's mm-hmm. he's the drafter. I've he's, experienced both. Right. Don't make him angry. Yeah. Nobody, well, nobody to light the scene. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like, you'll hear this if you go back and listen to any of the podcasts, but I was in the Navy and I was an illustrative draftsman in the Navy. Hmm. And I had a little bit of both. I, I had some people who th- literally thought that what I do is magic and, you know, and it should be a snap of the fingers. And then I had other people who would give respect. I mean, I was the level of what, what people think of as a sergeant in other uh, military. You know, I was an E5. And, wow. uh, and so in comparison to a captain or something, mm-hmm. you know, that's you're, you're a nobody, you're a flea. You know what I mean? And guys like that would come in there and just give me a lot more respect than I deserved, <laughs> you know, just because I knew how to draw and paint, you know, right. which was awesome. You know, Don't anger the wizard. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Don't curse us. <laughs> and they bring me my favorite beer sometimes. It was yeah. amazing. You must appease him with gifts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they don't, it's so, it's so amazing. There's, there's one level of person who, I don't understand this, therefore it's magic. Do it, do it now. And then there's the other level of people is, I don't understand this, this is magic, so therefore, hand, you know, it's hands off and I appreciate you. you Th- know? Those are my favorite types. Oh, of course. I, I think that's yeah. every creative oh, yeah, person's yeah. favorite type yeah. is to just do do your thing. Mm-hmm. Just just come back to us yeah. when you think it's done. And you tell me what you need to make this happen. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, what we always Which is always for. nice. But yeah. I mean, we've talked a lot about uh, this on the show where limitations breed creativity too. Of so, course. I think That's where the pressure is nice. The pressure mm-hmm. can be nice. But listen, I do want to jump back and talk briefly about uh, your experience with and, and apparently without school. Okay, just you started to tell us earlier about the fact that I think in high school, was it, uh, that you were able to start on computers or was that in yes. college? Yeah, well, that was in high school. Technically, small asterisk, it, technically everything started in middle school. But oh, that okay. was kind of the fascination with photography. And then in high school, it became mm-hmm. photography plus computers. Okay. And that's where I started. So it wasn't drawing like a lot of people who come on our show. I, I can had filmmakers tell us that they were born with a pencil in their hand and that's what got them started. So you started with a camera, though. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's, where every, I, that's where I would point the origin of everything. I cannot draw a stick figure to save my life. Okay. I have never been able to illustrate. I cannot currently paint. Jeremiah, I, get the gun. I'll get the paper and I'll the pencil. Know. And we'll see if he can do this to save his life. To save his, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> I um, because that's you know different people think in different. I I grew up with Legos, which okay. a lot of people did. Yeah, and Legos is uh, it's a structure. It's a, it's it's volume. You can build objects with it. So my my brain has always thought in terms of structure. Right. So if I can build it. I can just show you my idea. Like, just give me Maya or a 3D program. I can build it out and give you a sketch that way. Mm-hmm. Air quotes mm-hmm. around sketch. Air quotes, yeah. But I can't, there's something either genetic or, or brain tumor <laughs> or something that prevents me from <laughs> translating something in my head onto a 2D plane mechanically with a pencil. I can't do it. I just can't. Okay. And I embrace Fair that. Enough. That's fine. Fair enough. But I can show you a photo. I can, I can aim a little clamp on Home Depot lamp at your face and make you look (laughs) imposing. I can show you that, but I I just, I can't draw. You can think creatively and, and make, make an image or an object that somebody will respond to. Yes. That's that's art. So, yeah. So from there you, it was photography and then in middle, starting in middle school, it was, you did start with computers. Mm -hmm. How, How much experience in high school did you get with that? I mean, technically that would have been about Three, four years of just experimenting with digital photography and CG lighting and materials and and building things. So it was around that. Actually, 
I can tell you the exact moment that I knew I wanted to do 3D art. There was there used to be a network called G4, right. uh, Tech TV, which is awesome. It used to be awesome anyway. And there was a show called The Screensavers with Patrick Norton and Leo Laporte and and all those guys. There at the time the company was called uh, Alias Wavefront before mm-hmm. it split off before it became Autodesk. There's a representative there, and they were demoing the Personal Learning Edition version of Maya. And I think it was version three, five, or four, or something around that time. He drew a spline curve. He drew a profile of a curve, revolved it around the vertical axis, so it turned into like a pawn on a chessboard. Okay. And he gave it physics, and it just he pressed play, and it just fell down and bounced around, and then fell off into the void. Mm-hmm. And the second I saw that, like something just broke in my head. <laughs> it's like he did that in like five seconds mm-hmm. and there's this thing that didn't exist and now it does and now it's falling everywhere i want to do that mm-hmm. um and then I, I that's when i started bringing kind of photographs into 3d and everything mm-hmm. that was great and that's 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 something that very few people can pinpoint it's like this is when i knew mm-hmm. i couldn't do that i mean it's i've always known but i, I couldn't tell you exactly the moment but jumping forward High school, you were still working in right. computers. You were still learning mostly on your own. Mm-hmm. You did tell tell me earlier, and I'm I'm incredulous about what that means. By the way, when you when somebody says self taught, you called yourself self taught. Yeah. I don't believe in such a thing. I believe that you always get the knowledge from somewhere, and then you practice that knowledge. Yes, well, of course, yeah. But 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 someone somewhere has taught you something. Whether it be uh, fellow coworkers, or whether it be a book, or whether it be YouTube videos, or yeah. some some you learn uh, something relevant from somewhere. I, I had a thousand teachers. Right, that's right, the right. thing. I, I didn't. My teachers weren't on salaried payroll from mm. from an art college. They were they were everywhere. Okay, now let's get back to that though. Okay, you were planning on going to art school. I was planning on going to SCAD. Yeah, and what happened? Uh, I found out the price tag. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's that was the the main kind of thing where so here's the thing I took a tour of SCAD senior year of high school that, okay uh, sorry junior year of high school which would have been 2004, mm-hmm. 2003, 2004. and it was I, I visited Petter Hall in Savannah and I I went down to to SCAD Savannah because I don't believe SCAD Atlanta had opened yet at least not in any permanent capacity. I, I toured the facility. They they showed us all the Oscar nominated VFX teams that students had gone on and, and joined. So the the process was very. Um, it felt like that you know it was a first date, and and they were trying to woo you, you know, to to sign the oh, yeah. check to 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 get the bill for both parties, as it were. Mm-hmm. And it's not that like. You know, just the price tag alone scared me. It's like, oh, well, that's expensive. I'm not going to do that. It was really, it, at least in my case, I just so happened to discover that there was a huge treasure trove of things online available for free. What year was this again? This is 2004. Okay. And yeah. so, you know, probably not so much YouTube, which I don't think was, I mean, it was around, but it wasn't really like. No, but Big. I mean the Nomon Studios had started by that time, I believe, yeah. and there were other uh, there were other online sources that were starting to crop up. It's not like YouTube was the is or was or ever has been the only source for video online. I remember mm-hmm. uh, getting video all over the internet before YouTube existed. Right. Yeah. But it, at least in um, the thing that I gravitated towards was more of kind of classical art self education. You know. Why did anyone care about anything that Rembrandt ever did? Mm-hmm. What was he doing mm-hmm. that was so amazing? So studying technique, and I, I kind of approached the digital side, uh, digital art, which is what I do. I started by kind of going backward, which is where has traditional art been? Where did that oh, kind of come that. from? Why is it when Johannes Vermeer would paint something. Why did it look like a photograph? Right. Every single thing he did was amazing. And it turns out that maybe he used a system of lenses and mirrors and yeah. he mm-hmm. was doing camera obscura. It's like, okay, he, he created his own technique. Even so, that's creative. That is highly, highly creative. That's art. But it's, yeah. it's yeah. technical Especially for back and then. creative, right? Yeah. It's, it's the science with the artistry mm-hmm. and that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I, I don't care what medium it is. It's just great. 
That's kind of interesting because uh, most people I know who went to art school, their least favorite part of it was the art history part of it. Oh, that's foundational. Whereas, yeah, I, I loved art history. Yeah. Um, and it's funny that you didn't go to art school, but you you still did the art history. Yeah, because I didn't, you know, it's kind of the thing of like, you know, preferring a flip phone or a smartphone. You have a, a flip phone. It, it works. It's a perfectly fine phone. And there's a lot you can do with it. And then a smartphone completely, you know, opens everything up where you have apps and full screen video, high definition gaming, everything. You, I don't think people would appreciate just how wonderful smartphones are if they didn't have to go through the painful experience of flip phones and candy bars and T9 tap predictive texting input where you had to mash yep. a button three times. So if you know where things, if you knew how bad things used to be, and or you got how to hard ex- they were. Yeah. Exactly. How difficult things used to be. And then you get your first iPhone. It, it just changes your world. And you can appreciate that so much more. If you go, st- and here's where I get to, to bring mm-hmm. it back around. If, oh, you go, if you go straight into digital art and you are spoiled by the infinite number of things it allows you to do, you are not going to use all of those tools in, to, the, to the full depth that is possible. If you understand the limitation of traditional art and the history of of all of those crazy creative solutions they had to come up with using ink and canvas, then you can understand how it's evolved from like mirrors and lenses to ZBrush, right? So the things that you create with the digital art can still have kind of the same soul as the traditional thing, but you at least understand how it evolved from early days to the the capabilities of what you can do now. Right. That's awesome. And as a matter of fact, I I think you just answered what is normally our last question of the podcast, which is what advice would you give to some young hopeful who wants to also get into the career? And if I had to guess, I'd say your advice is literally what you just said is go back and learn where you learn where other artists have tread in the past maybe yeah re- respect the history of this industry and and start from from zero mm-hmm. Le- look mm-hmm. at the the first cave paintings that we've discovered um I, I don't remember what country they're in but modern animators have looked at them and thought that they have some of the most amazing keyframe poses mm-hmm. these are 2d scratch outs on a cave wall mm-hmm. with our early ancestors looking at animals fighting, you know, in planes. And they have better sketched keyframes than we are teaching people today. Mm-hmm. So clearly they had some sort of perceptual way of, well, obviously it would be perceptual, but they have had a way of seeing the world that we have since forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the technique of, yeah, just, I would say just find the oldest most fungus infested art book you can find <laughs> from like 1894 nice. and start there and then work your way up to, to modern times. Mm-hmm. You, do, you have to know where everything has been in order to appreciate where it's going. And just as a, a weird other comparison, I don't, whenever I've been doing work for games, I never look at other games. I, I don't, I don't personally care what other games are doing, not because I think they're wrong or because they're bad. I just, I don't want my perspective to be informed by everyone kind of being at the, the, the same level. Right. I always look to movies mm-hmm. because I consider film to be the highest form of visual achievement that we've ever done. Interesting. It's a 128 year old industry. And in games, we've only really been able to do what they do in movies for maybe five years. Mm-hmm. So we, we have some catching up to do. Mm-hmm. And I think studying, the people that have already crossed the finish line, so to speak, and not trying to copy them. Not You don't want to copy anyone, but to look at the technique of what they've discovered in a century and a few decades, I think they would kind of know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. So I, I like to look to the, the people that have gone farther visually and, and kind of steal from them. A cool. Little bit. Jeremiah, any further questions? Uh hundreds but uh <laughs> but we, do, we, have time we do not have time for hundreds no. yeah maybe another podcast who knows maybe we'll do a follow-up um hey yeah who knows it could be an anthology series <laughs> maybe we'll get uh like everyone from tripwire back here and have them do a tripwire shootout or something i don't know 
wink wink <laughs> all right mm. listen scott i can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on the show especially like i said earlier on short notice and it's really been a big learning experience talking to you both before we got on the mic and definitely now on the mic so i really appreciate it and i think our listeners are going to appreciate this thank you so much and hope to see you again awesome thank you guys so much for having me today 